And all right, you're all set. All right. Did the presentation come up okay? Yep. Looks okay. Good. Nice. Just one second here. Okay. All right, everyone, thank you so much for coming today. Um, today is um, Michigan Assistive Technology Programs Tech Tuesday, and the title of our session today is Introduction to Augmentative and Alternative Communication in AAC Resources in Michigan. And we're presenting today with our community partners from AltShift, Michigan Alliance for Families, along with some information from Disability Rights Michigan. Um, so for questions and some housekeeping today, I'm going to give our lovely chat moderator, Abby, a moment to let us know about some of the things we have available to support your needs today. Oh, you're too kind. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, so basically, if anyone has um, a question or comment, um, please feel free to unmute and just ask your question if that's easiest for you, or if you prefer to type in the chat. I will be reading anything that goes in the chat out loud just to make it everything as accessible as possible. And if you have any questions on how to do the muting or unmuting, or if you need help finding how to turn on your captions, we have a live captioner. Um, if you go on the bottom of on your menu bar, there should be a CC button um, where you can click on that to turn on your captions. Also, we have an ASL interpreter here with us and I'm glad I'm mentioning this just to remind myself to try and talk a more at a steady pace because I get really excited and I talk really fast and then I'm like, oh my bad, sorry, ca captioner and interpreter. Um, and Deanna, I see you have your hand raised. Raising your hand too is a perfect thing. If you wanna unmute and ask a question, you can do that. Um, and if you accidentally raise your hand, that's okay too. I love the reaction buttons. <laughs> Saying thank you. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Deanna. <laughs> and um, if you need help with the captions or anything, just let me know. You can private message me too if you're like, don't read this out loud, Abby. Um, you feel free to private message me. Um, and. I feel like there was another thing I normally like to mention here, but that's the thing Facebook. that we love. It's very flexible. And if you have questions, feel free to just jump on in. Um, and oh, by the way, my name is Abby and I'm on the assistive technology program. I am an AT specialist for gaming and crafting and I will be chat moderating today. And Caitlin, uh, would you like to introduce yourself and then uh, with Carolyn and Stephanie as well? I sure will. Hello, everyone. My name is Caitlin Herman. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a speech language therapist, and my role at the Michigan Assistive Technology Program is I'm an augmentative and alternative communication assistive technology specialist, or AAC AT specialist. Um, my email address um, is Caitlin at mymdrc.org. That's Caitlin, C A I T L I N at mymdrc.org. And um, we will also have that available for you at the end in our resource guide. Um, and Abby can send it to you in the chat directly if that's helpful. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to um, one of our other presenters, Carolyn, to introduce herself. Hello, everyone. I am Carolyn Parker. My pronouns are also she, her. I am an assistive technology and augmentative and alternative communication specialist uh, with AltShift, which is a um, office here in Michigan through the Michigan Department of Education Office of Special Education. And we'll talk about that more. 
My email address is carolyn.parker at altshift.education. And I am so thrilled to be here. Thank you for having me. And then Stephanie, will you introduce yourself as well, please? I would love to. Thank you, Caitlin. I am Stephanie Nichols. I am not a speech language pathologist. I am a parent and I am the training manager at Michigan Alliance for Families, which is totally free informational across the state. And we'll talk more about that later. These phone numbers that you see here for me are statewide phone numbers that will connect you with a local person in the area that you live. So the 800-552-4821 through the magic of technology connects you with the regional parent mentor in your area. Wonderful. Thanks, and thanks, and actually, Caroline. Yes, Kelly, uh, nice. Thank you, Carolyn and Stephanie, for joining us. Um, Kate, uh, Kelly did just remind me um, we are live on Facebook. So if anyone on Facebook would like to join the Zoom, the link is in the caption there. And also, if you would like to see the closed captions that we have prepared on screen, you can join Zoom because it doesn't show up on Facebook. So um, once you fill out that registration, you'll automatically just get that link so you don't have to wait for anyone to approve it or anything. You can just jump right on. Wonderful. Thanks, Abby. Um, and as Abby mentioned, if you have questions at any time, feel free um, to reach out um, by unmuting or by um, popping a message into the chat. Um, all right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, the first thing we have is our agenda. Um, today, we're going to do an introduction to AAC. When I say introduction, I mean introduction. Almost any one of these slides could be a full presentation on its own. There's a lot of detail um, and nuance, but there should be enough information to answer some foundational questions for you. And as always, if you have questions about more things or want to know more later, please feel free to reach out to us and we can help get you more information. Um, after we do that introduction to augmentative and alternative communication, we're going to talk about some resources in Michigan. Carolyn's going to talk about the Alt Shift program and the different things that um, they can offer to support people with their communication needs um, throughout the state. And then Stephanie's going to take um, some time to go over what Michigan Alliance for Families does and how you can connect with them. Uh, we also have a little bit of information to share from Disability Rights Michigan about AT access in schools. And then um, we'll go over what the Michigan Assistive Technology Program has available as well. And hopefully after all of that, we'll have some time to talk about additional AAC resources. If we are short on time, and we do have all of those listed for you in our resource guide that we'll share at the very end. Um, and if you have any additional questions about those things after today's presentation, you are more than welcome to reach out and we can provide more information for you. Okay, so getting started here, I just want to take a quick minute um, to um, check in to see um, where you're from, if you feel like sharing what county you're part of, and if you um, would like to share um, your identity, if you're a person with a disability or a family member or guardian, or if you work in education or health or rehabilitation or with assistive technology or have another identity you'd like to share, just um, be wonderful to hear um, about where you are all coming from. And on this slide, I do have a picture of the state of Michigan um, with all of the county lines marked out. Yeah, and uh, Deanna wrote a little bit earlier that they know that there are disability volunteers, secretary workers of partition uh, house project about 29 years okay. and that they knew the AAC device voice box and Deborah said she, they are from Oakland County, their job coach and the living and at the living and learning center. And Kelly, hmm, that sounds familiar. They say they're from Ingham and they are a person with a disability and also work directly with MATV. Oh, nice. Wild. Thanks for sharing, everyone. <laughs> glad, um, you, oops, glad you could be here from wherever you are today. Yeah, we got some from Oakland County. Um, uh, Vanessa uh, oh, is an SLP and evaluates for AAC devices in a private clinic. And Sarah is a vocational rehabilitation rehabilitation counselor with MRS, the Lansing District Office. Oh, usually I'm not used to this much interaction. I have to actually scroll back up. <laughs> I'm loving this. Um, Melissa is from Kent County, SLP AAC, Mary Freebed. Uh, Jaleesa, oh, that looks familiar too. Salek, person with disability, woot woot. Uh, Frank says uh, they're from MDRC, Eaton County and person with a disability. Katie Livingston, co-parent, 
Angela, love that name, early childhood specialist and behavior coach from Wayne County, Wayne Risa. Wonderful. Thanks for joining us today from wherever you are. Um, I'm glad to have you all here. Um, let's go ahead and start talking. Woo! Let's go ahead and start talking a little bit about augmentative and alternative communication. So what is augmentative and alternative communication or AAC? The augmentative part stands for communication that supplements or adds to speech. The alternative part talks about communication that takes the place of speech. Communication in general is the active process of exchanging ideas between two or more people. And then when we put all of it together, augmentative and alternative communication, that means or refers to all of the methods or modalities of communicating except for speech. Now, when we say AAC, people often think about like the AAC systems, the high tech systems, things like that. But A AAC also includes things like gestures, facial expressions, body language, drawing, spelling, and writing. Those are ways in addition to speech or spoken language that we can also communicate. And on this slide, I have a picture of a hand uh, pointing an index finger, a pencil writing a squiggly line, and a person with long black hair smiling. Um, when you think of AAC, what do you think of? So I've said, you know, a lot of times we're thinking about like those higher tech systems or, um, you know, things like iPads and apps and things like that. I would love to hear um, what ideas or what words come to your mind when you think of AAC or when you hear AAC. You can name an app or a system or a company or something related to therapy or a process of using AAC or maybe a describing word or a feeling word about AAC. Yeah, we have social connections and independence. Yes, definitely independence. Participation. Mm. I used to think of apps and standalone devices. Me too. When I was new, like I was like AAC, oh, that's just the board you point at or an iPad. But it's so much more, obviously, than that. But uh, Casey says accessibility. Yes, wonderful. Yeah, I think those are all, I, I mean, I think that the chat group has kind of picked out some of like the major overarching concepts of AAC. It's that that independence, um, creating social connections, increasing accessibility and participation in life. Thanks for sharing. I have a little, I um, forgot to mention, there's a little line drawing of an astronaut, uh, astronaut on this slide with a megaphone um, shouting out for you all to share your ideas. Um, so... Let's talk a little bit about the types of AAC. There are two main types of AAC. We have unaided AAC and aided AAC. So unaided AAC refers to some of those examples that I mentioned previously um, related to the body. So unaided AAC doesn't need any external items or tools. You only use your body. So facial expressions, um, you know, hand gestures, um, moving your body, um, you know, taking a person by the hand and leading them somewhere, um, body language, those sorts of things. Um, to represent this, I have a picture of um, three older adults with white hair, all giving double thumbs up on the slide. Of course, the thing about um, like gestures, a lot of time, uh, those are very um, individualized depending on the culture and the area that you are. Um, so there's um, many aspects to that as well. Um, so we talked about unaided AAC. Aided AAC is AAC that uses a tool outside of the body. Um, now, one of those that I already mentioned is writing. So like a pencil and paper or pen and paper. Um, that would be considered a light tech or no tech or non-electronic form of aided AAC. Um, light tech AAC is AAC that uses no electricity. It's often made of simple things like paper or plastic. So examples of that are writing, drawing. There might be printed um, symbol icons cut out individually or on communication boards or assembled in communication books. That can also be things like 3D printed symbols as well. And then we also have mid tech aided AAC. That's uh, typically AAC that might use a battery and generate or produce speech, um, but that also has like more of a limited number of um, symbols or words that it can have or um, oftentimes has a static display. So that might be something like um, 
a single message switch. So over on the right side of the screen, there's a little black flat um, uh, switch that has a red circle button on it. And with a mid tech device like that, you can record a single message like I have something to say. Um, and that switch is only going to say that pre recorded or predetermined phrase. So it can be a little bit um, limited in terms of producing variety, but can definitely still has um, its place and can be a really useful communication tool. Um, I also forgot to mention above that I have um, an image of a few different communication boards with varying grid sizes as well. Um, and then below that in the bottom right hand uh, corner of the page is um, a higher tech AAC device. It's a tablet with a blue case and it has a four by eight grid on it with icons, with picture icons on it. And high tech AAC is what we often think about when we talk about AAC. That's typically a computer-based system. Um, oftentimes we see them in tablets nowadays. Um, they usually have rechargeable batteries. And these systems are great because they can offer a more dynamic um, display, meaning that there are several layers or pages worth of icons or words that folks can access to. And these also provide um, speech generation. Any questions about anything so far? I know I'm, when I get excited about something, I tend to talk really quickly. Okay. So we talked about unaided and aided AAC and the different levels or types of AAC. Um, and I do want to say before I move on to the next page that when we think about light tech, mid tech, and high tech, no form of AAC is better than the other. They all um, have um, pros and cons um, and all are part of communication. So it's good to be familiar with um, all different types of AAC to meet different needs in different times and places. Um, Next, we're gonna talk a little bit about access methods um, or selection for AAC. Selection pretty much is the way a message is produced by the AAC user within the communication system that they're using. Direct selection refers to the AAC user choosing a word um, directly from the array. So oftentimes we think of this as, you know, um, pointing and um, touching with a finger, whether that's on, a um, light tech printed board or on a high tech tablet device, um, but that may also be accessed directly with a knuckle or the edge of a palm. Some people may use their chin or nose or may use a stylus. Um, direct selection can also be done through eye gaze systems as well as using um, like computer mice or joysticks or those types of things. And then um, we also have indirect selection options, which means uh, refers to scanning and scanning can be done with a partner. So if it's a light tech communication board, the partner might start listing the words in order and then the communication or then the AAC user can indicate which word um, they want to say. Um, or if it's a higher tech system, the system has a way um, to be pre-programmed to start scanning through the words one by one. And then um, the AAC user can select which word they want to say. Um, that can often um, be done um, on the higher tech systems using switches, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Um, the images I have on this slide are of um, a woman holding a high tech AAC device, and there is a child um, directly selecting with a pointer finger um, a word on the device. And then below that, there is a child with brown skin sitting in a wheelchair, and they have a mounted um, high-tech AAC system on their wheelchair. And then it's connected to two switches um, that are used for scanning. And often when they're, well, not often, but you typically the setup for two switches is that one switch starts the scanning, and then the second switch selects the word. And there's all sorts of ways um, that that can be set up. And um, I'm not kidding when I say we could do a full training, just like a full day training, just talking about access methods um, because they are so um, individualized to the AAC user. And there's so many different ways to set that up. Um, so if you do have more questions or want to talk more about this later, um, please don't hesitate to reach out. Okay. Um, so who uses AAC? Well, as I mentioned, we all use one form or another of AAC um, at different times in our lives for different reasons. Um, oftentimes, um, when I um, give this example to people, I talk about, you know, we um, send emails and we text 
text and we use emojis, um, but also all day long when we're interacting with people, um, we may be using, you know, facial expressions and gestures and body language. Um, when we think about adding an AAC system, there's a lot of reasons why someone might benefit from adding an AAC system as one of their um, commonly used communication modalities. Um, it could be because they're non-speaking or part-time non-speaking. They might have motor planning needs that make producing speech difficult or producing speech consistently difficult. They might have a disability that impacts their language development and could benefit from an external system to help them organize their thoughts. Um, someone could be recovering from a medical intervention like a recent intubation or perhaps um, neck surgery, or um, even sometimes if someone has like su significant laryngitis or um, you know, is a vocal performer and needs to be on vocal rest um, and uh, needs to, a different way to communicate. Um, there's all kinds of different reasons why someone could benefit from using AAC. And I think one thing to remember about um, using AAC systems is that it's one communication modality for a person. Uh, and that all communication modalities are valid. So just because someone can produce speech some of the time doesn't mean that they wouldn't also benefit from using AAC to augment or add to their speech. Um, I hear a lot from neurodivergent folks who talk about days or situations where um, they might, their sensory systems might be overwhelmed and producing speech um, might just feel harder. And so having a different way to communicate, having AAC allows them to more fully express their thoughts and ideas um, at a time when speech would be difficult. Um, and as I mentioned a little bit, some people might be full-time AAC users or part-time AAC users. And um, someone's um, AAC needs may shift throughout the day or um, over the course of their lives. Um, so there are lots of different ways that that can look for different people. Um, on this slide, I have a picture of a parent and a child sitting side by side, and they're smiling while the child selects an item on or selects a word from their AAC device. And then below that, I have a drawing of two teenagers. Um, one is using um, an iPad with a communication app on it, and the other is holding up a smartphone uh, with a communication app on it, and they look a little bit different. And so sometimes, um, as people age or in different situations, they may use different AAC systems. Who can use AAC? Everyone. There are no prerequisites or foundational skills required to start using an AAC system. You don't have to have a certain skill level as far as language development or even learn, knowing how to navigate technology, for example. Um, everybody can use AAC. Um, part of figuring out what AAC is best for each individual is part of what we do when we um, complete an evaluation. Um, but there are no hoops to jump through or things to prove to show that you can use AAC. Everyone is a candidate for AAC. And um, well, as we talked a little bit earlier when I was asking what you think about when you think about AAC, we talked about those powerful words like access and participation and social connection and autonomy and independence. And those are the big reasons why um, we want folks to have access to AAC and why we don't want to gatekeep and say that someone needs to be at a certain stage or level to use AAC because access and social communication should be available today, yesterday, your whole life through. There's no reason to wait to introduce an AAC system. On this slide, I have um, some line drawings of a few different people using AAC. I'm in the top right corner. There is a child sitting crisscross on the floor and they're holding a book in one side of their lap and an AAC device on the other side of their lap. And I'm thinking this to me, this child is reading using their AAC system. Uh, and it looks like they're reading independently. Um, another uh, picture I have on this slide is of a teacher sitting at a U table holding a book up and the child sitting across from them um, is using their AAC device to communicate with the teacher. And then you can see there's a peer sitting um, at the table also who's reading a book. And then a third picture I have on this slide is of um, perhaps a young child and a teenager, um, both um, looking at a communication device and making different hand gestures 
um, while they're waiting for the other to communicate. So having access to AAC can increase our independence, like this child reading a book alone. It can increase our access to things like our learning, like the child with their teacher, and it can increase our access to social connection, like it can with the child and teenager at the bottom of the page here. Um, that leads me to talk about the Communication Bill of Rights. I apologize. I know this is a lot of words on one slide, and I'm not going to read it all today, um, but there it will be the link um, in the chat for you to click on if you'd like that, and it's also in our resource guide at the end. Um, I bring this up. Um, it was developed by the um, National Joint Committee for the Communication Needs of Persons with Severe Disabilities, or NJC for short. Um, and I bring this up because it's really important, especially when we think about introducing AAC to make sure that everybody's on the same page about how to create access for the AAC user and what that process should look like. And essentially it comes down to that every single person has the right to express their wants, needs, thoughts, and ideas to who they want and when they want to. And um, I encourage you to take a moment after today's presentation um, to read through the Communication Bill of Rights a little bit more. And if you're a parent, um, it's a great tool to bring in uh, to any team meetings with your child where you're discussing AAC or communication options. Um, if you are a therapist providing AAC evaluations, it's a great thing to share with families. Um, or if you're any other educator or medical provider or support person, it's a great thing to bring in um, to the conversation anytime AAC is being, to dis being discussed to make sure everyone's on the same page. Okay. So how do we get started with AAC? Um, typically, uh, we would I would encourage you to reach out to a speech language therapist who can take the lead on providing an evaluation. Evaluations can look a little bit different depending on um, the individual's needs and the setting that they're in, that they're in and sometimes um, what the funding source is. Um, but typically an evaluation process includes the individual's case history. So that looks at things and considers things like someone's medical history, their current medical status, their education, their occupation. Um, and a big part of that is also looking at their access needs. So what vision needs do they have? What hearing needs do they have? What motor needs do they have? What sensory needs do they have? It also looks at their current communication skills and needs. Um, there are communicative competencies we can consider. And when I say communication skills and communication competencies, I'm not saying them as they need to be at a certain level to prove they can use AAC, just merely for the fact that, you know, determining where an individual is at so we can figure out what system system will best support their needs now and in the future. We want to look at those things. Also considering how someone um, processes language. Uh, traditionally, historically, um, people thought about language development in kind of one way. Um, now we call it analytic uh, language development. And that's sort of like the, you know, we start out at the single word level and we build that bigger and bigger to phrases. But there are a lot of people who actually are gestalt language processors. And that means that they start processing bigger chunks of language at a time. And as their language develops, they break it down into smaller pieces. Now, a lot of our um, high tech communication systems, AAC communication systems we have now, aren't necessarily set up for Gestalt language processors. However, there are customizations you can make to better support people who are learning language like that. And again, that could be an entire, just that little bit there could be an entire presentation on its own. So if you have more questions about that, please feel free to reach out. Um, and another actually, big thing. To oh, sorry, I was gonna say, Sarah asked, um, are schools required by law to provide AAC if needed? And if so, personalized or just generally one size fits all? That is a fantastic question. If a student can benefit, if AAC can help a student better access their education, which includes not just their learning, but also their socializing, absolutely yes. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk a lot more about that later in this presentation, uh, particularly, I know Stephanie has um, quite a few resources about that for you as well. Yeah, um, great question. Um, okay, um, we also want to look at um, when we're doing a, an AAC evaluation, we want to look at the individual's language and communication preferences. So what language do they speak? What dialect do they speak? Um, also, um, symbol needs and preferences. I didn't talk a lot about symbols today, 
um, but essentially symbols referred to how the word is represented. It might be done by a photograph or a line drawing or a color drawing, or it could be a word completely depends on the individual's needs. Um, and also one thing to consider is the long-term communication goal. Um, as I already mentioned, an AAC evaluation can be completed a number of different ways, but there are quite a few helpful tools or approaches to doing that. Um, the SET framework developed by Joy Zabala is a fantastic framework to use um, for um, assessing AAC needs, but also um, any assistive technology needs. Um, the SET framework looks at the student, the environment they're in, the tasks they're required to do within those environments, and the tools they have and the tools they need to do those tasks in those environments. Now, again, that's a really quick explanation. We could spend a whole day talking about the SET framework, um, but it gives you an idea of, you know, we want to understand what an individual's communication needs are so we can make sure that the system we, we find for them meets those needs. Um, we can also look at the participation model. Uh, so, for example, if we have a first grader, um, we might go into that first grader's different classrooms and see how are the peers participating in the activities throughout the day? How is how is that individual participating and what can we do to help um, make uh, or help the individual uh, participate um, more like their peers or participate in the same ways as their peers are? Um, there's also different things like the pragmatic profile for communicate for AAC users, um, the communication matrix. Um, we can do ethnographic interviewing, which really gets at individuals' experiences rather than asking more leading questions. It's more open-ended questions. Um, we also look at interviewing the support team, and all of that comes down to doing feature matching, which is more like maybe a little bit science and a lot of it art, <laughs> which I think it could be a whole presentation on that as well. But feature matching means we take all of these things we just evaluated and we say, okay, what features does an AAC system need to have in order to support this individual's communication needs? And um, typically after doing um, all of these things I've just mentioned, um, we also do a trial of the AAC systems. And now the length of the trial and what that looks like can be different depending on the environment um, and the funding source of um, the individual. So, you know, in private therapy, if we're submitting to private insurance, some private insurance companies have different requirements about so many devices trialed over so many different weeks. Um, schools, um, including early on settings, um, have different rules as far as their IEP or IFSP process goes um, when doing evaluations. Um, and then in medical settings as well, um, AAC evaluations can happen and that can look different depending on the individual's insurance as well. Um, now, a good AAC evaluation is often interdisciplinary, which means that includes not only the AAC user, but also their family members. There could be occupational therapists, physical therapists, teachers. And so when I say teachers, like that could be a special education teacher, their general education teacher, it could be their specials teachers. Um, psychologists, social workers, paraprofessionals are often um, critical members of the team in providing an AAC evaluation in schools, and any other medical or educational um, professionals that um, are part of the individual's team. Yeah, and Carolyn mm -hmm. mentioned too that um, schools are required, in response to Sarah, said that schools are required to provide AAC if the student needs it to access Oops, sorry, move dummy, a free appropriate education and it should be personalized to them. And then Deborah said, I'm curious if a nonverbal adult can have an AAC evaluation and get technology and what resources to start with. And then thank you, Amy wrote, Caitlin can provide it through our program. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the answer is yes. A non-speaking adult who has never used AAC before is absolutely still a candidate for AAC. There is no point in life where like, you know, it's been too long and it's not going to be worth your while. That's, that's a myth. That's not true. We can start using AAC systems at any time. Um, so absolutely, please do reach out. And I would love to provide you more nuanced and individualized resources to help support you with that. And thanks, Carolyn, for um, helping answer some of those questions in the chat. I appreciate that. Okay, let's see here. Um, consider more considerations of AAC selection. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, no form of AAC is better or no communication modality is better than another. However, oftentimes high-tech AAC 
um, will provide more of a robust communication system. And by robust, I mean broader, bigger, more customizable. Um, so things um, to consider about more of those are benefits of um, considering a more high tech um, AAC system is that they typically have a larger quantity and variety of um, organized words um, that include core vocabulary. So those are words we use all day long, like, um, you know, pronouns like I, you, me, um, little words like the, prepositions like on, um, and kind of those core words like like and go that we can use in a lot of different ways. And also fringe vocabulary. So um, think about more nouns like farm animals or craft supplies or different kind of categorical um, language. Um, a good AAC system is also going to offer some grammatical supports. Um, so not just having the words in one form, but like, you know, if we use the word go, we could say, you know, we are going or, um, you know, past tense, they went to the store. So being able to use more of those grammatical markers. One thing I will say about that, though, is that there's a long way to go with developing grammatical markers of dialects in our AAC system. So, for example, if someone uses African-American English, um, some of the grammatical markers in there are not as easily accessible in traditional AAC systems. That's something that there are folks that are working on, but there's still a way to go there. So if you're looking at getting an AAC system set up for someone who uses that dialect, there are resources available that can help you work on those customizations. Um, and related to that, um, high-tech AAC systems are very customizable to voice output. Um, there's a lot more voices available now than there used to be. And um, it's best to select a voice that best reflects the individual's age, gender identity, race, ethnicity, dialect, language, and cultural identity. And we also want to look at making sure we're customizing the symbols to reflect the individual's race and, any, and adding any of their personally relevant vocabulary. Um, also, these high-tech systems also allow for future growth. So because they're customizable, we can add more things um, as life goes on for individuals. And we want to make sure that whatever system we're picking or whatever systems usually we're picking for an individual, that it's not just supporting someone's ability to make requests for things, right? We want people to be able to communicate for a variety of purposes all day long. So requesting, sure, but also questioning, expressing self-advocacy, protesting, learning how to say no in all the modalities is super, super important. I cannot underemphasize that and um, teaching consent practices. Um, asking for help, describing an emergency, sharing their health status, and telling jokes, sharing humor. We want a communication system that's going to support communicating for a variety of purposes, and that can be available at all times. However, I will say that high-tech communication systems, um, their screens can break and need repair. Batteries can need charging. Systems can need updating at really inconvenient times. Um, also, some locations aren't ideal for taking a high-tech communication system, especially if it's a really high-tech dedicated device like an eye gaze system that's a very big uh, oftentimes it can be connected to bigger um, devices that might be heavy to travel with. Um, but, you know, if you're going to the beach or to the pool or to the water park, you know, we don't want those devices to get wet or overheated or sand stuck in the crevices, um, that kind of thing. Um, or if like someone's playing a sporting event, you know, carrying like a heavier device around their neck or shoulder might be a safety issue um, or certain environments like the bathroom or um, the kitchen area. If you're prepping raw meat, um, there can be some sanitary concerns with having high tech systems in those places. So having backup communication modalities um, available um, for any of those different situations is always, always, always recommended. Um, and I like having backups on backups on backups. There's, there's no reason to not make a bunch of backup copies, you know, stuff one in the glove box of the car, in the backpack. Um, I've had students who have taped little uh, communication boards inside pencil boxes or their agendas or planners. Um, known people um, carrying them on key rings or lanyards. I've seen them printed on pillowcases and beach bags. Um, I've helped students um, 
waterproof them and add them to pool noodles so we could take them in the pool um, so that they could uh, communicate well in the water. Um, there's all kinds of different ways to set that up, but I recommend um, making considerations for those backup methods from the beginning. Um, the picture on this slide um, is super cool. I forgot to mention, by the way, I found a lot of these images from Canva, um, which I wasn't familiar with until recently. They have a lot of neat things there. Um, but I loved this image so much. It's of a girl um, it, sitting in a wheelchair that's super customized. It has a really cool uh, pink and turquoise seashell on the side. And um, the girl is wearing these really cool flowy turquoise pants. So she's got like some good mermaid vibes going. Um, and you can see attached to her wheelchair, she has a high tech um, AAC system mounted on an arm. And then on her tray table, she also has what look like yes, no icons. So um, she has the yes, no available on the tray table. And also she has the rest of her robust communication system available on the high tech AAC system. So she's using multiple modalities at the same time. So there's no reason it doesn't have to be one or the other. It's always yes, use them all, have them all available. Um, so how can we support someone who is learning to use AAC? Um, creating a language rich environment by providing modeling is key. Now, when I say modeling, I don't mean modeling as in imitation, like I do this and you do the same thing. I mean modeling with the languages for the sake of providing the language, providing the example of the language. Um, this can be known as aided language input or natural aided language or aided language stimulation. And there's whole day trainings on how to support um, people with this process. Um, but what it kind of comes down to is using the device to communicate throughout the day in a lot of different contexts um, for the individual. And remembering that the communication is an invitation, not a demand. So for example, you know, if there's a child who's learning to use their high-tech AAC system, they're pointing to a box of cookies up on the shelf. You see the box of cookies, they see the box of cookies. Everybody knows like, oh yeah, like they're asking for the cookies. That's your normal routine of asking for the cookies. Having that use their high-tech device to ask for cookies might create a little bit of frustration there. But what you could do as the communication partner or as the partner supporting a language environment is you could use their device and say, oh, cookies, you're asking for cookies, let's get those down. So you're inviting them um, to use the device. You're showing them how you could talk about cookies on the device, but you're not necessarily making it a requirement. It's not a demand on them because their other AAC, their gestures already communicated to you what they want. Now there's a lot of um, nuance in teaching um, individuals how to use AAC systems, but um, I think it's important to remember that always we're not demanding or requiring people to use their AAC systems. We want people to be independent and autonomous and decide for themselves how they would like to communicate. Um, another thing we can do to support individuals learning AAC is remember that, um, or I'm sorry, to acknowledge all communication um, made by the individual and make meaning of what they what they say or what they aren't saying or what they're expressing, even if we think it's a mishit or if they hit a button they didn't mean to on their AAC system. Um, remembering that all communication has value and that no communication modality is superior to another and that the goal is communication. Another thing we can do is to allow for processing time. Um, people whose main modality of communication communicating is speech often expect a quicker back and forth, back and forth. And if that's what you're used to, sometimes you may feel awkward or a need to fill in the silence um, while someone is um, typing out or accessing or formulating what they wanna say on their device. But I encourage you to be patient and to take a deep breath and to um, live in that silence and give that individual the opportunity um, to say what they want to say, especially while they're learning, it can take a little bit longer. And if your attention drifts away, then that person might not be as communicate or as motivated to communicate with you the next time. So stay engaged and stay patient and try not to question, 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 give them the opportunity to respond. Another thing we can do to support someone who's learning to use AAC and anybody who uses AAC is to be aware of and honor their alerting method 
Um, some people might use a gesture or a tap on the table or make a vocalization or have a button they press on their device, or maybe they use a single message switch that says, I have something to say. So make sure you understand what that is for the individual and that you can pay attention to that. So if someone's working on developing um, a sentence or a longer sentence to communicate with you that you know they're, they're telling you they want to communicate with you. And um, last but not least, we want to treat someone's AAC like their voice. We don't take it away for any reason. Um, you know, sometimes reasons happen like, you know, batteries needing charging or screens breaking that are out of our control, but we don't ever want to take away someone's AAC system because they're, um, you know, they're just playing on it or they're, um, you know, um, maybe being a little rough with it or that kind of thing. Um, we want to make sure that um, we're treating it like their voice and being respectful of it, like it's part of that person's body and um, making sure that it's always available to them. And part of respecting it, um, as I mentioned, is making sure that we have backup systems for if something happens to their main modality. Um, on this slide, I have a um, picture of um, an adult holding a high-tech AAC system with a child sitting on the floor in front of them, um, touching buttons while uh, it looks like they're playing with cars. And then I have a photo um, of an adult with long hair holding a communication book and pointing to an icon in there as well. Any questions about that very quick, not quick introduction to AAC? Megan, feel free to unmute and ask or type in the chat. Mm -hmm. Okay. I will turn it over to Carolyn Parker to talk about Alt Shift. Woohoo, Carolyn! Yay! <laughs> Thanks, Caitlin. I love hearing you talk about AAC. <laughs> so, I am thrilled to be here today to talk to you about Alt Shift. Um, Alt Shift is a uh, grant funded initiative through the Michigan Department of Education Office of Special Education. Um, and our grant is funded through the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So that's where our funding is coming through. So we really focus on um, the education side of things here in Michigan, but we have a lot of resources available um, to other individuals, parents, families, um, or outside service agencies. So I know some of you said that you worked um, as a therapist in an outside agency, and so we have something for you as well. But uh, mostly we deal with the education side of things here in Michigan. So our mission is that um, we collaborate with educators and families to improve outcomes for every student. Um, so we really try to bridge the gap between uh, general education and special education and give really good strategies and content that works for every educator, regardless of your students' needs that you work with. Our office is tasked with covering four main content areas. So we work in accessible digital materials, assistive technology, communication and literacy, including augmentative and alternative communication, and also math. So if you have interest in any of those areas um, or even just spark of an interest, um, we have resources available to you. On the next slide, we, you can see our team. Our team is small but mighty. Um, so there are eight of us that work uh, full-time for Alt Shift. Kate and Jeff, um, our top photos are our uh, administrators or directors. Um, we have Cheryl and Ashley who work in our main office in St. John's and do some really, really amazing uh, behind the scenes work for us. We would not be able to function without them. And then uh, we have the four of us that make up our specialist team, myself, Sarah, Carlos, and Rachel. So Sarah and I work specifically with assistive technology and AAC, math, uh, and then math is covered by Carlos and Rachel. 
One of the main resources I want to tell you about today with Altshift is our lending library. Our lending library contains a large amount of assistive technology equipment, and it is available to all Michigan schools, um, excuse me, public schools and public school academies. So as Caitlin was talking about the evaluation process, um, she talked about the trial period of, you know, assistive technology can be expensive when we want to try it. Some of those electronic devices um, that she talked about. And what we don't want people to do is to go out and buy this equipment without trying it for a student. Um, so that's really where our lending library comes in. So uh, we have devices, uh, non-electronic to electronic assistive technology devices that are available to loan out to Michigan schools. Uh, we do have an eight week loan length. That's one of the longer loan or trial periods. We want you to get a really, really good idea of if the tool is working or not. And we do not have a fee for our loans. The only cost associated is we do ask that schools pay the return shipping. And we also are always looking for new items for our lending library. So if there is an item that you're looking for that we don't have, Ashley, our lending librarian, will take requests for new items. So on our website, if you ask for something that we don't have there, I can tell you there's a good chance that we'll be able to get it. So uh, a few other specific things that we do in our lending library, uh, we do offer POD books. POD stands for Pragmatic Organization Dynamic Display. And that is a specific type of AAC that works well for some individuals. The uh, cost of printing POD books is quite expensive. So uh, our office has taken that on, that we uh, work to print those to, uh, I'm sorry, we work to print those for individuals who need them. And we also offer custom key guards. So if you have an individual who uses a communication device who could benefit from um, some extra fine motor uh, or I'm sorry, if they have difficulty with fine motor and they could benefit from borders around the buttons on their device, that's where key guards come into play. And we do print and ship key guards at no cost to Michigan schools. So um, on this page, I do have a picture of a pod book and two of our custom key guards, yellow key guards that have been printed. Awesome. And Carolyn, we have a question. So with Alt Shift Library, a school request rather than individual um, oh, so it's more school request, not individual, correct? Yes. So, well, a school a, a school personnel has to request it for an individual. Okay. So right now we cannot loan to fam directly to families, um, but families can certainly work with their school uh, to get a device for their student. We just, with our funding, we uh, ship directly to the school. Thank you. Yes. I see, Deanna, you said, Sarah, um, that you might know Sarah. And so I will definitely tell her that you oh, are really? on our, yes, that you are on our, uh, our webinar today. If I you, see, so you're not in her head. She's like, yes, yes. yes. Awesome. <laughs> if you need to contact our lending library, um, anyone is, uh, anyone can go on our website, altshift dot education slash lending dash library. Any individual can go on and look at the inventory in our lending library. Um, if they're, like I said, if you are not an individual that works in a school, but you think there is a device um, that might work well for someone you work with, you can absolutely work with um, a school agency to uh, request that device. Ashley, like I said, our lending librarian is wonderful. You can email her directly, lending.library at altshift.education uh, if you have questions. And she is great at um, connecting people with devices that could be useful to them. So please, please, please reach out to Ashley. And I went ahead and put that, put that link in the chat for everyone too. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. And Deanna's like, I knew her. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, awesome. She'll be so excited. <laughs> That's awesome. 
All right. The other resource we have um, through our website, and this is available to everyone, is we do have online modules um, in four different training courses. So our online modules uh, are great because you can go at your own pace in learning. They typically use a combination of video, text, and some practice or reflection opportunities. Um, but our current modules, we have one for each content area. So we have a course in accessible materials made right. If you're interested in learning more about accessible digital materials, we have the assistive technology journey. If you are interested in learning more about the broad array of assistive technology that's available. Our course that's specific to AAC is called Building Blocks to Autonomous Communication. Um, so this covers uh, a lot of what Caitlin has already mentioned today and also goes deeper into AAC and providing that to individuals. And then we have our Foundations of Math course that really looks at math instruction and how to cater our math instruction uh, to best meet the needs of all students. Like I said, those are available on our website. Another awesome thing we do, and one of the things I love most is our statewide trainings. So our statewide trainings are either live virtual events like this, or in-person trainings. And these are offered, um, oh, I see Deborah asks, are they free trainings? Yes, yes, they are. Our online modules are free. Um, our statewide trainings do typically have a cost associated with them to help cover um, you know, the cost of the space and things like that. But st our statewide trainings are open to educators, family, any outside service personnel. We want everyone to have access to the information if they can. Um, so you can see our current winter offerings. Um, we have our AT Journey Online is a live course that we're currently going through right now. We do have two trainings coming up. So if this is something you would be interested in, my email will be available at the end. Our registration for both of these events is closing soon. So I would love to get you connected and registered as soon as possible if you're interested. Both our building blocks and foundations of math uh, registrations close at the end of the week. So we would love to get you on the list to join us for those. Um, all of our events are online at altshift.education. The final uh, way that we support our school districts here in Michigan, um, which is a little bit more specific, is that we do partner with intermediate school districts in Michigan. So if you are an educator who is um, part of your intermediate school district and you are looking at one of our course content areas to bring to your area, I would encourage you to reach out about a partnership. So Altshift comes in and we work with um, a team from the ISD to bring in training and resources um, surrounding uh, those four content areas. So again, we look at building the capacity of educators to improve learning for all students, um, not just specifically general ed or special ed, but all students involved. So sorry, I was muted. I was going to say sorry. Uh, does uh, Deborah ask? Does the AAC class actually delve into how to use specific AAC? We do talk about AAC implementation, and we cover um, a lot of different devices. We um, it we give opportunities to practice with different devices, uh, but we don't talk a lot about uh, one or two specific tools because. Um, students typically use such a wide array of devices. Deborah, if that answers your question. And Deanna just commented saying that they would like to learn the device. Oh, awesome, Deanna. All right, so when to contact us. Um, so I broke this down by educators and parents, but it should say educators or therapists or you know outside agency. So if you are an educator looking to trial assistive technology equipment, um, our lending library is available to you. If you want to expand your learning via online modules, parents, educators, therapists, we would love to have you get in touch with us or if you're looking to expand your learning uh, via an in-person training. If you wanna go sit in a room with someone, 
We love that. Um, again, parents, educators, therapists, we would invite you to um, get in contact with us. Um, and then specifically for your educators, if you're looking to expand your district's capacity to support all learners, we would love to um, engage in a partnership. So the last slide I have is our um, contact information, our website again. Oh, Abby, I see you're on it, putting that in the, the chat. So our website is altshift.education. We do have a newsletter that comes out monthly with our events. Um, and we do have also an events page on our website that is the most up-to-date with trainings that we offer. Um, but you can also contact me directly at carolyn.parker at altshift.education. Thanks, Carolyn, so much for sharing that wonderful information about the wonderful work that you all are doing at Alt-Shift. Does anybody have any specific questions for Carolyn at this time before we turn it over to Stephanie? All right, Stephanie from Michigan Alliance for Families is up to speak to us about their program and what they can do to support Ooh. families in our state. Thank yeah, you, Stephanie. <laughs> That's the introduction, introduction I always want. Thank you. Uh, we appreciate you asking us to join you today. And I love hearing like the basics of AAC. I think it took me like a year or two to figure out what you just described. So I am Stephanie Nichols. I'm the training manager here at Michigan Alliance for Families. I have a loved one that uses an AAC device. She does currently use a high-tech device um, at sometimes and not at other times. She uses it most often at this point to um, model how to spell words so she can find the, the word in her device and then she can type and continue to write her paper or her response or whatever she's doing, but she uses it to support um, her other community, another mode of communication at this point. I wanted to share with you just like a little sampling of our lives with AAC that my loved one is currently 15. And if we look at this image on the lower right, um, this was before I knew what AAC was as a parent. Uh, she had received a timely Valentine's Day card from her grandparents in the mail, and we received that Disney movie club thing where you could put all the stickers in. And we live in this communication time where all of the information streams into our houses and we can get anything at any moment. She built this as a toddler, very small child, um, that she wanted to be able to ask for the movie that she wanted and have it show up on the TV. And she took these stickers and built a way to communicate what she wanted. Like this was our starting point where we were still talking about wants and needs and not talking about more complex communication yet. But this is that serious drive that humans have to communicate those wants and needs and this is how she wanted to do it. So I love sharing that this was her first AAC that she built herself and made sure she could get her point across. Um, in the image to the left of that, you are still seeing um, those specific wants and it's getting very specific where she wants to go to a specific store and buy specific things and this is how she's requesting um, what we're going to do that day. And up top, you see that there are actually two different devices. We were trialing the smaller device as she was getting older to look more like her peers, to have things that were other things that teenagers were carrying around. And we were both utilizing what the big or the little device to practice what that felt like and how that communication went and if that was functional or not. Um, if you're curious, she does car currently carry the smaller one, the one that can slide into her purse just like everybody else's phone does. So that is a little smidgen of information about my household and our experience with AAC and how passionate um, I personally am about this topic and how glad, Caitlin, um, I am that you invited us to come talk about this. Now I want to zoom out a little bit and tell you about Michigan Alliance for Families. Um, if we can go to the next slide. This is a um, whole bunch of different members of our staff, and these are all people that have a loved one like I do that um, currently receive or previously receive special education supports and services. So Alt Shift said, we are for everybody. Michigan Alliance for Families is really for 
family members of students that currently or previously receive special education supports and services that we all have that lived experience. Um, everyone lives in the area of the state where they serve, so they're connected to the local resources there. They know how to get you in touch with those people. Um, and one of the really fantastic things is that we all have these different lived experiences and we're able to pool our knowledge, um, share it with each other, share that expertise, share our knowledge that we have from different trainings and different information, and then share that out with families. So um, it really allows us to be impactful across the state that we come from different households where we have um, different experience, different work experience, different life experience, but we were all already trying to have impact in our communities. And that's what drew us to Michigan Alliance for Families. So I personally had been running an AAC social club um, when my child was in elementary school before I even was connected to Michigan Alliance for Families. We have um, different family structures. We have different disability diagnosis. We have different eligibility categories, but the thing that unites us together is that we all have a loved one um, with a disability or we are all self-advocates that are trying to navigate special education. So we can share that information out and let families be more impactful. Um, I think that gives you a pretty good idea of kind of who we are at Michigan Alliance for Families. If we wanna go ahead, let's dive into kind of what we do. Um, we help families better navigate what their rights are within special education. We saw something in the chat earlier. Somebody said, oh, does this happen through an IEP? Um, and that's a question that we hear across the state that people don't know what their rights are. We are totally free parent training and information. So we help families understand our federal law the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA. We help them understand what that looks like in Michigan and how that's implemented through MARSH, the Michigan Administrative Rules for Special Education. It really defines those requirements for special education. And when you know what your rights are, you can have a more collaborative conversation. You can say, we have to consider assistive technology for every student with an IEP. Have we considered that for my child? What does that look like? If um, we think about the broadest strokes of special education in this country, like we think about the purpose of special education, if we wanna go ahead to the next slide, the purpose is really to make sure that eligible students with disabilities receive the free appropriate public education that they need. So it is, tailored to that one human being to meet their specific needs and prepare them for the future. And that needs to be in the least restrictive environment. Families don't know these pieces and students don't always know how to self-advocate for these pieces. So we want to make sure that those all come into focus and they're able to have these valuable conversations and get the support that they need for assistive technology, for AAC, and for all of their other needs related to their disability. On the screen, you see a very, very busy graphic. It has a lot of letters all over the place. Um, if you hunt through this image, you will find AAC in there. You will find AT in there. You will find all sorts of other acronyms that need to be decoded and need to make sense. That is what we do at Michigan Alliance for Families is help people break down some of this information and know what it really means that these acronyms are thrown around in professional lingo and we wanna make sure that we can have meaningful conversations um, where families are really involved in their child's education. So we can kind of decode what these things mean and why they're relevant and why they're important. Our big goal, our main mission at Michigan Alliance for Families is to empower families um, because when they understand their rights they're able to communicate their child's needs and they're more involved in their child's education, it leads to better outcomes and services for our kids. It leads to better futures for our kids, that that is what we want to have happen. That the data is really clear on how this parent involvement is directly related to better outcomes and long-term goals for our kids. We do it through a lot of different ways and um, 
I want to give you broad strokes, but make sure you have enough information to find it in the future that when you are thinking about how to get more information about what special education has to look like, what evaluation has to look like, what AT has to look like in school, um, we have lots and lots of information on our website. And that is there for you 24 seven where you can go to the search bar and type AAC and get more information. Um, we break it down by age, we break it down in a lot of different ways so that you can get that to that information fast. We also have recorded videos um, for your learning on our website. So if you have enough time to sit down and watch a 30 minute presentation, great. If you only have 10 minutes, we're on YouTube and YouTube will remember where you're at when you come back to it next time. So all of that information is there for you as you have the time. We also have um, learning opportunities that are primarily virtually, vir no, primarily virtual. Let's get that word correct. I apologize. <laughs> um, those are live where you can interact like this and ask questions. We um, provide our own learning opportunities and we partner with other agencies across the state. So like Alt Shift comes and talks about Assistive technology is more than just checking a box and how to have collaborative assistive technology conversations that those are um, two learning opportunities that are coming up on the calendar. We also have a learning opportunity called behavior is communication that is talking about all these different modalities of communication and how we honor and respect those and how we take those into consideration when we're making plans. So lots of live learning opportunities. I am going to go ahead and drop the link to the upcoming learning opportunities in the chat for those of you that are interested. Um, our bread and butter is our parent mentors. They are all across the state. They live where they serve. You have that specific question about your child and what's going on right now. Um, they provide one-on-one -on -one assistance. They connect you with the local resources. They collect, connect you with the statewide resources. They make sure you have those pieces. Um, in focus of what you need and how you can get connected with more agencies and more information across the state. One of the things we find as families is like you feel like you're alone on an island and there's nothing and then you get connected to one spot and the web grows really fast that once you find that good connection point you get everything that you were hoping existed you just didn't know where to find it before. So we want to be that connection point that gets you connected with the information that you need. Uh, we also have a lot of partner agencies across the state that we refer to and we know what they do where we can say this may be a good fit you may want to connect you may want to check this out um, and we want to make sure that families are getting to all of those connection points yeah and sarah mentioned in the comments that they share your alternatives to guardianship recordings with students and their families all of the time so thank so thankful for all of the resources available on your website Thank you, Sarah. I'm glad to hear that. We also have a supported decision making um, presentation that's coming up that is fantastic and complements that alternatives to guardianship recording and will be added to the library within, I'm going to say the next six weeks, it'll be in there that we will be able to have that video also. So lots of great information that's out there. Um, special education in Michigan is from birth, can go all the way through age 25 to age 26. We support all of those ages. We support all of those stages. Assistive technology is relevant and different in those different times. Um, so seeking us out for more information on what that can look like. And we are totally free that there is not even a method for us to take payment. We don't charge for any of those things. You can come to the virtual learning opportunities in person, watch the videos, check out the website, get all the information that we have different sources for funding. That's how we are able to provide all of that information, but we do not charge anyone that attends any of our um, anything. So you can talk to a regional paramentor, you can come to a learning opportunity, you can do each of those 10 times, and those are all going to be free for you. I love that um, Carolyn and I have a similar slide about when you should reach out really for Michigan Alliance for Families. Um, if something doesn't make sense, that's a great time. If you want to um, understand your rights in special education, or if you want more information on disability in general, if you don't have a good understanding of what's in your IFSP, your Individualized Family Service Plan, or your IEP, your Individualized Education Program, that's a great time. Um, if we're seeing challenging behavior, if we're seeing frustration, if we're seeing communication challenges, those are all a good time to reach out for Michigan Alliance for Families as well. 
So if you think maybe they could help, call us, email us. Um, we are here to help. That's what we do. And we want to provide people with information and resources. This is our map that you see across the state. This is what our um, regions look like at this point that we try and make sure that we have equal representation for the number of IEPs in that area. And if you call 800-552-4821, our smart technology connects you with the regional parent mentor where you live. We do also have a Spanish speaking regional parent mentor, which is 313-217-1060. Um, and soon we will have an Arabic speaking parent mentor line as well coming soon. Keep you posted. Um, feel free to follow us on Facebook, on Instagram. That YouTube channel has all those recordings. You can check out all the information on the website whenever it's convenient for you. Um, and I'm really glad that I'm able to share the information with you today. Thanks, Stephanie, so much for taking the time to share with us about all the wonderful things that Michigan Alliance for Families is doing to support families and individuals, individuals with disabilities in the state of Michigan. Does anybody have any specific questions for Stephanie right now? Okay, um, if you think of any, any, bit, any of them a little bit later, um, hopefully we'll have some time here at the end. Um, I'm going to take a minute now to review a few slides from Disability Rights Michigan that Sarah Healy from Disability Rights Michigan generously sent over our way um, to tell us a little bit about their organization and how they can support individuals and families as well. Oh, and actually, Caitlin, sorry, before you start, I think Dana just raised her hand. She might have a question for Stephanie. Oh, go ahead, Dana. You know, Stephanie? Oh. oh, okay, yeah. And sorry, at first, when you first started talking, yeah. you know, weird feedback, at least on mine. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that you are so connected with the AAC community, it seems like. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Thanks That's for so sharing, great. Diana. <laughs> Great. Um, okay, so Disability Rights Michigan. Um, Disability Rights Michigan is the independent, private, nonprofit, nonpartisan protection and advocacy organization authorized by both federal and state law to advocate and protect the legal rights of people with disabilities in the state of Michigan. Um, Disability Rights Michigan receives a federal grant to provide information, referrals, or direct advocacy to people with disabilities who have been denied access to AT and or AT services. And Disability Rights Michigan works to ensue that or to ensure that all people with disabilities in Michigan can get the AT and related services they need in order to live more independently. Um, when should you contact Disability Rights Michigan? If you have questions about what type of AT is available or are trying to figure out what type of AT you need, uh, they might refer you over to the Michigan Assistive Technology Program for more individualized support. Um, but they also have some resources available too. In the resource guide we'll share at the end, there is a link to one of their YouTube videos that it does a really nice job explaining the basics of AT or assistive technology. Um, they can also help you answer questions about if your health insurance will cover AT and AT services or what to do if your health insurance has denied AT or AT services, um, questions about if your child needs AT at school um, or if you need AT at work. Um, Disability Rights Michigan can provide information and referrals. 
self-advocacy training and support, help with writing reasonable um, accommodation or modification requests, um, assistance with drafting letters or complaints, and they can help review appeal document, review appeal documents and support with filing appeals. Um, if you have any questions for Disability Rights Michigan further, they have a toll-free number listed as 800-288-5923. And then they have a voice number at 517-487-1755 and a TTY number of 517-374-4687. And you can find them at www.drmich.org. And all of this contact information can also be found in the chat and in our resource guide shared at the end. Um, one more thing I wanna mention is that all of the services provided from Disability Rights Michigan are free and confidential as well. Any questions about Disability Rights Michigan? Okay, so I'm looking at our time here. We got less than nine minutes until we agreed to be done. And I have to tell you, I did, I, I've got to talk about the Michigan Assistive Technology Program, and I have a lot of resources um, after that. So I will give us an overview of the Michigan Assistive Technology Program and see what time we have for um, questions at the end. I might just um, work on highlighting a few of um, the resources provided. And if you have additional questions, we can talk about those later. So the Michigan Assistive Technology Program um, is housed at the Michigan Disability Rights Coalition. Um, our mission is to cultivate disability pride and strengthen the disability movement by recognizing disability as a natural and beautiful part of human diversity while collaborating to dismantle all forms of oppression. Um, I'm gonna skip over what we focus on for today um, to talk a little bit more about the Michigan Assistive Technology Program. So the Michigan Assistive Technology Program is a free federally funded program that provides AT related supports for the state of Michigan. All 50 states and six territories have a federally funded AT program and the Michigan Assistive Technology Program is ours for the state of Michigan. We can provide awareness information, um, training, demonstrations or demos, and those can be, those are customized virtual or in-person how-to sessions to explore AT that meets your needs. Now that could look like you have a specific piece of AT you wanna try, or maybe you have a general area of need where you might need some AT to support you and we can help provide ideas um, both ways. We also have a lending library and a loan program. So we have over 1600 pieces of AT um, for demo or loan. And we're kind of the ultimate try before you buy lending library. So if there's a piece of AT you're curious about um, trying out, but aren't sure if you wanna spend the money on it, we would love to um, provide a demonstration for you on how to use it and give you the opportunity to borrow it for a while. Um, the Michigan Assistive Technology Program or MATP is by people with disabilities, for people with disabilities, their allies and other community members. And we serve the entire lifespan. The only requirements to access our program is that you are a person who lives in the state of Michigan and you're a person with disability, with a disability or a person who is aging as well. Um, so I think we talked a little bit about AT already um, through our presentation, but I do quickly want to go over the AT is any item, piece of equipment, software, or app that is used to help people with disabilities, including older adults, do what they want to do. Now, lots of people use technology to make their lives easier in lots of ways, but for people with disabilities, assistive technology opens up possibilities and access in their lives. On this slide, I have a few different pieces of AT. There is a um, uh, like silicone doorknob grip that can help make opening doorknobs easier. There is a color coded and day and time coded um, pillbox organizer. And there is a very cute fluffy companion pet stuffed animal who barks and turns his head and interacts with people. And if you wanna know more about any of these items, please feel free to reach out to us so we can tell you more. Um, just a brief overview of the types of assistive technology we have. I love to talk about this because um, there might be areas of AT that you don't realize um, where there are things available. And the cool thing is there's new things available all the time. So we have AT for daily living, personal care, cooking, routines and tasks, 
AT for safety. Um, our fabulous chat moderator, Abby, um, is, her area of expertise is AT for, oops, for gaming and um, arts and crafts. And um, uh, another one of our colleagues who I think is hanging out here today, Jalisa, um, is our specialist for um, outdoor recreation AT. So we have AT for fishing and hunting and camping. Uh, we have e-bikes. We have um, AT for mental health and for neurodiversity. We have AT that can help people set up workspaces and help them at work. Um, we have AT for communication, for parenting, and so much more. On this slide, you see there's um, the first picture here shows some adapted controllers for gaming. Uh, we also have um, gaming, our AT for gaming, like board games and card games. So you see this blue plastic um, card holder that has an array of cards in it. And then we also have um, flexible seating options. We have this little um, green um, seat cushion. Um, I think they call them balance discs a lot of the time. This might be um, great for someone to have to have a little bit of wiggle in their seat um, has bumps on it for texture and input. Um, and we also have um, this um, in the lower right hand corner here is um, a liftware, which is a spoon that has um, cool AT in it that helps it maintain balance um, for people who might have a tremor, have a hard time keeping food on their silverware, can help them eat more independently. So we have lots and lots and lots of things. This is just a tiny little slice of what's available. I also wanted to highlight um, some of the AT for communication that we have available in our lending library. We have things um, like um, mounts and um, clips um, to mount things to tables and wheelchairs. We also have a number of different switches. We have some of those mid-tech items um, like the single message switch, single message switches or sequential switches um, or this um, little gray item here is called a quick talker. This is one of those mid-tech items that has a static display on it, but is still customizable. And then we also have a number of different iPads with communication apps available as well. Um, okay, um, the when to contact the Michigan Assistive Technology Program information is on uh, in our resource guide. So I'm going to hop over that for now because I want to make sure we have any time for questions. My contact information um, will be in the resource guide as well. Um, and the contact information for the Michigan Assistive Technology Program is in there. Um, I do want to highlight a couple of things real quick. Um, for the resources, um, there is a link for the new guidance from the U.S. Department of Ed uh, regarding individuals who need AT devices and services at school and how it relates to the Individuals with Disability Act. And um, there's a lot of good information and resources there. I also included an article summarizing some of those changes. I encourage you um, to take a look there. Um, I also wanted to highlight... Um, some of the organizations available. The United States Society for Augmentative and Alternative Communication has a lot of really good resources. They also have an emergency preparedness course um, that is free to take um, that gives a lot of really good tips um, and advice for um, preparing for emergencies and how to create backup methods um, that are available in like your go bag and that kind of thing. Um, many of these websites and organizations have training available as well. A lot of it is free and some of it is at cost. Um, if you have questions about what type of training might be right for you, I encourage you to reach out to us. Um, I think we have one minute left to go. So I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna have to forego the rest of these resources for now. I apologize. Does anybody have any questions before we end our Tech, tech Tuesday talk today? Feel free to type in the chat or you can unmute. Also, Caitlin has so many good links and resources. I love me a good link. Um, and there's a lot of cool stuff about like following people on social media and like to get books. So, um, so I'm excited to check it out and I already have access to this, but everyone will have access to this. Um, I got a lot of thank you. So thank you from Kelly. Uh, Stephanie says so much great information. Thank you, Caitlin. Uh, this presentation was recorded, yes. Can I? How do I access it to watch it later? A lot of thank yous. So yes, it what it is recorded. And actually, thank you for the reminder. I'm going to stop that recording. Um, it's also live on Facebook at the moment.